This is Ben and Skin on 97.1 The Freak. We are straight up vibing right now. We are so excited. I would say we're downright giddy because two of our favorite dudes ever are joining us together in studio. Getting either one of these guys by themselves would be a massive interview. Getting one of them to come join us in studio would be huge. But the dynamic duo is here they are here together. I'm talking about the greatness of Michael Young and Ian Kinsler. Whoa. Let's go. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I, I just said noticed dynamic you... duo. I wasn't have to like pull off a fake Dirk accent. And he's going to have to do Luca over there. I thought we were going to fake it the whole time. But... I didn't even notice you guys were in here. This is amazing. <laughs> I just looked up and you're right here. That's crazy. I'm like, this is incredible for us. Probably less incredible for you guys. You guys get to see each other quite a bit. So we'll start with you, Michael. How often do you get to see Mr. Ian Kinsler? Um, we see each other a lot. I, I, honestly, like I wish I could see him more. You know, we we pretty much uh, we have the same job with the team. Um, we both play, try and play golf with the, each other whenever we can, and then we the rest of our time we chase our Utes. That's what we do. Are y'all Utes similar ages? In between. In we between, got, it. Yeah. yeah, they're kind of staggered. Yeah, but they're all. I mean, I mean, my uh, my oldest is probably out of the out of the age range, and then it kind of just stacks like his daughter, then my son, and then his son, and then mine, and they kind of all interact whenever they see each other. It's definitely. I mean, especially with his oldest daughter and my middle son, it's kind of like uh, it's funny. It's like brother sister relationship. It's pretty cool. Yeah, they grew up together. You know the whole COVID pod pod school deal. Right, you know? right, so they, right. They had uh, they had a year of school together, but. Uh, Mike's about to send one to college, so he's becoming like a real grown man. Oh yeah. man, you know, college kid. Jeez. Yeah, I know. Where are we with that? Uh, he's eighteen a, he's, year old. He's eighteen. He's a senior at Jesuit. He's going to Loyola Marymount in L.A. in the fall. Okay. Yeah, he's pumped. He's pumped. Hank uh, Gathers, home of Hank Gathers. You guys got two. Remember? There you oh, go. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And Bo Kimball was Bo on Kimble. that same team. Lefty free throws. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I, I got to ask you. But your friendship, one of my favorite parts of it, and we just stumbled across <laughs> this, but. We were talking to Michael Young, and Michael had said, uh, you know, here he is, the all-time hit leader in the history of the Texas Rangers. And his wife was talking about one of his kiddos needing a hitting instructor. And we were like, wait, he is the all-time hitting leader in the history of the Rangers. Why would his kid need a hitting instructor? And I just think that's a funny thing. Now, as a parent, oh, I learned full, wholeheartedly what that means. My parents do not want me to tell them anything. And if they wanted to be in radio, they wouldn't listen to me about anything about radio. But that said, did you guys pull a switcheroo at some point and Ian started teaching Michael's kids how to hit and, and vice versa? Did that happen, Ian? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> absolutely. He so so as you all know, you know, watching Mike play, he hit the ball the other way so beautifully, right? Like it was just easy for him, natural. I was more of like a lean back and pull it guy, you know. I'm hitting everything to the left, I'm hitting everything in the air, he's hitting everything low and on the ground the other way. So it's like you need to talk to my kid. You need to teach him how to hit the ball the other way. And then I'll teach your son how to pull the ball. <laughs> and then, you know, it'll be a nice little, nice little mix. But, um, yeah, I work with Amelia a little bit and, and he's definitely worked with Jack. So it's been, it's been good. Is yeah. there, I don't know. Do the kids feel pressure? Do you think working with dad's buddy that was a Texas Ranger? Like I'm, I'm sure they act different with you than they act with their own dad, but can you tell how they feel about all yeah, this it's, it's a it's a weird dynamic yeah. because i mean we played together right it's like you know if they would open their eyes a little bit it's kind of the same person giving them the, the same advice same but, thing but <laughs> it's when i say it to his son he's all wide-eyed and <laughs> when he says it to my son my you know i'm telling we're saying the exact we're same saying the same thing we leave Ken ken's house and we're on the way home, and my boys are like, "Man, he knows so much. Man, we gotta, when are we gonna go back?" I'm like, "I'm saying the same thing, but I'm just dad, right? I mean, for him, it's like, can we stop at Shake Shack on the way home? But the baseball info he's gonna get from Kins, and then, that, so we kind of said, "Hey, listen, when we're with our kids, we gotta, you get, you get this one, and I get that one." That's the best possible illustration of the idea of communicating a message is also dependent upon the person receiving the message and whether or not they want to hear it. That's 100%. the best ex example of that I could possibly think of. Yeah, and it, it's a, it's an everyday occurrence. Yeah, when you have teenagers, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I I I want to bring this up. There's so much we want to talk to you guys about. We're so grateful to have you here. But I said this earlier on the show, uh, and this is no disrespect to Michael Young, but I oh I felt like no one in baseball ever wore their uniform better than Ian Kinsler. <laughs> the baggy pants look with the high stirrup socks is the way to go. 
You know what I'm saying? Like I, I love that look. And so as a dad, I've got I'll show you pictures of my kids when they're playing youth sports. I was getting their pants tailored. They were rocking the kids. <laughs> Look all the time. So, what was your approach to the way you wore your uniform? Um, you know, it was it was a process. <laughs> I mean, you just always did it like you just always did it like that. I always did it like that until I got to University of Missouri for my junior year, and their pants were trash, and I just couldn't get them up. My, I would pull them up to my knees, and there's just this this huge pad of rolled up pant around my knees, super uncomfortable. So I just that was the only time I went down, and then pants down and then another time i went pants down was uh switcheroo day yeah hank yeah. blaylock in uh oakland. oakland we're struggling as a team whatever um this is my rookie year and he says everybody's got to go pants up and i'm like sweet i'm already there you know <laughs> um so wore the pants up and then he like kind of remembers maybe a week later we're back home and he's like oh, wait, we need to do a pants down day so all the guys that wear their pants up, you know, they're uncomfortable. So I went pants down, first ball hit to me, just booted. Yeah. Just, made, just made a mess of it. Oh. And I think if I remember correctly, too, when that year's baseball cards came out, they got you with pants down. So you <laughs> yeah. got a baseball card. Like, oh, the most really? random yeah. game is a pants down day. Yeah, just one time. Yeah, I think that whoever, whatever company zooed that one that year because my car was a picture of Rod Baraha stabbing into third. <laughs> that was your card? Yeah. It wasn't it said you? my name, it's Barajas. I'm like, <laughs> give me someone, give me someone super handsome. Is that? Give me Jamie Wright, Wait, I, big I, handsome. I know it's a big deal, but I don't follow it. Does that mean that that card is extra valuable? I hope so. Like I got a state bunch. card. Yeah, and, and I don't think anyone even like <clears throat> every time like I've had a chance to sign that card. By the way, you don't sign much stuff anymore. It's all pictures and stuff, but. Every time I've had a chance to sign this car, I'm like, that's not me. And they all go like stare at it. No one knows. So I don't know how to take that. Because I don't find Rod to be very attractive. <laughs> they, do they bring it to you Shout to sign out. it? Even Shout though it's out, not Rod. you? Brahas. Sorry, Rod. Yeah. You, so out. people have brought you a Brahas card to sign? No, it's me. It says it says my name. Yeah. Right? And it's yeah, Rod but, diving into third. Yeah. And oh yeah, they're all like, can you sign this? I'm like, you know, this isn't me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no one knows. Wow. No one sign knows. it as Rod Brahas and just see what happens out there on I the market. Should. That's a great point. I do should you, do that. Ian, do you remember yeah. the first time you met Michael Young? Uh, yeah. I mean, not the exact. Mo- I mean, I remember like, tell, like the yeah, you know, yeah, the spring aura, training, the aura, spring training. Okay, so you know. walk us through what well, was going on. My my first spring training was like Mark Teixeira, Hank Blaylock, Michael Young, um, Kevin Minch, Barajas, Sorry. um Soriano was there. So I just. You know, that was like the the aha moment for me. Like, I'm in the same locker room as these guys. They're all cutting it up, super relaxed, comfortable. Um, and I'm just trying to to see how this, this whole thing works, right? So not a lot of conversation happens the first time you get into these situations in the locker room where, um, you know, you're a young dude, you're a rookie. You just kind of sit back and watch and try to soak it all in. So, um, and Mike wasn't a very vocal vocal leader. You know, he led by example. So, we didn't have a lot of conversations early, um, but one conversation that does stick out is my rookie year. I missed a bunt sign late in the game, and uh, just I, I screwed up the at bat. You know, I wasn't prepared. Whatever, um, and things happen, right? You make mistakes, and he was hot. Mike was hot, and he never really gets hot, right? He's very even keel, um, but he was just he was upset because I wasn't prepared. It was a mental mistake, right? He never he never got on anybody for physical mistakes. If you made an error, you know, tap you on the back and let's go get him next time. You make a mental error, and Mike's going to be upset because he was always so prepared. Um, and he came over to me and said, did, did you miss a sign? I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I miss a sign. He's like, you got you to gotta stay on top of those things. Those are super important. Usually signs are given late in the game, seventh, eighth, nine. You've got to be locked in. you got to know the situation. you got to have, a, you know, you got to be thinking ahead of the game, all these th- different things. So, um, you know, that was, that was one of the moments that stuck with me as far as preparation and just making sure that, you, that you're ready for every game, every situation. How common is that in baseball to have one of the players, like, hold you accountable? I mean, you play on a lot of different teams, and so yeah, not, is that common? Not common. <clears throat> not common. I think it's um, it's weighing heavy on staffs now. You know, staffs are trying. There's there's these huge staffs. Everybody has so many coaches on staff. There's like, you know, t- 10 coaches or eight coaches. It used to be five or six. Um so they, they seem to be a little bit more responsible for that. But the power of your teammate telling you something, teams that do have it, like the Rangers Clubhouse, they have that. They hold each other accountable. 
uh, the teams that do have that, they they usually win. I mean, that's how you hold each other accountable and you, you expect to play well for your teammates. And, you know, that's that, that usually works. Uh, I'm interested. By the way, Michael Young, Ian Kinsler, joining us in studio here on the Ben and Skin Show. So let's talk about the reverse of that. Michael, You, when younger players come in, and then Ian, later in your career, you experience that. But when younger players come in, you probably make some assessments, see how they carry themselves, what they have, and then that changes over time. Do you remember initial thoughts of Ian? 100%. Um, super confident. Um, it could tell right away he could play. Like, you know how it is when you go into spring training, they always say the young player, you have a chance to win the job. Like, we knew the job was his. Um, and I remember, like, when we were getting close to breaking camp, uh, I did, he's right. I, made, I usually made an effort to not say too much to young players. Not because I was trying to make their life worse. I just was a firm believer that rookies had to kind of figure things out on their own because his path m- might not be mine. And I wanted to make sure I'm like, hey, listen, I'm here for you. I'll be watching, but some things you just got to go through on your own. Um, I don't remember the example he set, but I mean, I do think I agree with them when when good teams have that. And at the time, we were kind of fighting, scratching, clawing to try and become a good team. Uh, but then I, you know, I see that you know we've hung out before, and uh, you know Nick Castellanos has you know had a great career, and he talks about the things that Ken said to him in Detroit, right? So those are things that kind of get passed along, and I'm sure he's doing the same thing for young players now in Philly. So that's what you hope for, right? As a player, you get to pass it along to every generation, and uh, they get a chance to help the young kid coming behind him. So, Michael, when did you, you know, Ian had just referenced you as a leader, and we we've, we saw that firsthand. And when did you go from just being a guy in the clubhouse to realizing, okay, I, I have to lead? When? How did that evolve? Uh, in, in one day, when mm-hmm. Alex got traded. Really? Wow. It happened like that. Wow. Um, it, my third, I was going into my fourth year in the big leagues. We had, before then, we had. The, the amount of vets we had in that clubhouse was crazy. You know, it's uh, Alex and Rafi, Pudge, Juan, you can, Ruben. You can go on and on, right, right. with that group of guys. Um, and all of a sudden, they were all gone. Yeah, they, were, they were all gone. And Alex was the last one to go. Um, so I had had my first kind of good year the year before, so I thought I'd be, you know, staying second base. And Alex is gone. Um, and you just know you're – you never say you're a leader. I, I don't buy that because you don't get to anoint yourself that. Um but I kind of just felt eyes on me, uh, and I kind of knew at that point that my, my role had changed, you know, if that makes sense. And that was it. So yeah, going in 2004, man, my fourth year in the league, I was like, here you go, ready or not, this is this is what I got to deal with now. So it was cool. I didn't I didn't have a, an issue with it at all. I, I liked my teammates. I thought we had a chance to to be good. Uh, we could really hit, and that was that was kind of where that role started. I always think back to what the stories are at the time, the media perceptions, and then there's also what's really going on in the clubhouse, what the players think. And from the outside at that point, it seems to me I remember there being a big to-do about Alex saying he doesn't want to play with the kids or however that was articulated, and that became a story that people talked about. Uh, For you guys, and then here you are like in your fourth year and you're feeling like you're one of the elder statesmen. Was that some sort of like a chip on your shoulder or did you even feel the, how Alex articulated that? What was going on in the clubhouse? He called me actually when that thing came out. Um, and I, I knew Alex. Um, of all the guys in our locker room, I probably spent the most time with him. So I knew kind of like, you know, you know how Alex is a lightning rod, right? So if you don't know him or you don't know what he's trying to say or you don't want to read between the lines and some, by the way, it's no one's responsibility to read between the lines. Right. Just say what you say. Um but I kind of knew what he was getting at. His point was when he signed here, he had assurances that now we were trying to be what the Rangers are now. That's what he thought he was getting into then. And, you know, they basically, they signed him and pulled everything back. And he's like, hey, well, this is not what we signed up for. And, you know, he said what he said. It wasn't the smart thing to say. Um, but um, I kind of knew what he was getting at. And so I didn't care. Uh, but, I mean, the day that article came out, guys in the locker room did care. Right. There were some guys in there that were flat out pissed. So, I'm sure they use it as a way to kind of get themselves motivated. I couldn't care less. Um, I just wanted to have a good year for the sake of having a good year. All right, so as you guys uh, – look, this this last World Series just caught me by surprise. I, I was not prepared for it. I did not expect that to happen. I didn't know that the Rangers were going to go on this incredible run. And so we want to talk to you guys about 2010-2011, the building of that team, and then also being in the front office for this ride. But as – Going back to when you guys were there, did you know, Ian, that you guys were turning that corner? Like, did you know that, okay, we are badass, like we're a legit contender? Was there a moment that you're like, okay, we've arrived? Yeah, there was. And it was, it, 
it happened over a couple of years. That's why this team, the team that just won the World Series, is so unique. Where it kind of just came out of nowhere, right? They they were they were in first place all year, and then they kind of hit a lull towards the end. And um, I felt like the fan base never really like jumped on board. If you compare it to our 2010, 11 years, where you know there's Texas Rangers flan, you know flags up and down the tollway and on the, all freeways in front of houses, people are going crazy. There's tailgating going on. Um, it was a scene. And this team kind of snuck up on everybody. And I think that's the difference. But we did know um, going into 2010 that we had something special. We were, we were still a little bit unsure. We were still a little green. But, you know, we, we had Vladimir Guerrero in the middle, which was a huge confidence booster for us because we saw him just, just kill us for years in Anaheim. Um, and then to be able to take him off of that team and put him right in the middle of our lineup, you know, Hamilton and, and Cruz and, you know, Napoli and – um, everything came together and, and we pitched well enough. We had, we had guys, uh, on the pitching side that were just, they had huge hearts, right? Like they never gave up. They, they took the ball every five days. Um, they went to, they went to battle and, and, you know, that's where this team now is probably a little bit different because of the dome. Really. I think you're, you're able to attract these pitchers now where if you guys remember that old ballpark, no one wanted to come to pitch here, right? You know, no one wanted to sign here. The, the chance of the Rangers signing a top end free agent pitcher was was off the table. Um, but yes, to answer your question, we we felt that we weren't openly cocky or or you know like we were in 2011. We weren't as, in my opinion, we weren't as confident confident in 2010. But once that ball started to roll in the season and we started figuring out how good we were, um, we we all we all understood what we had. Okay, well, then let's fast forward. As you guys are growing as a team, there's craziness happening off the field because you're in bankruptcy court. Yeah. Did that impact you guys in the clubhouse? <clears throat> no, no, I don't think so. Uh, we got asked about it a lot. Uh, I think a lot of the guys actually were, were pretty clueless about it. Um, <laughs> I think there were two groups that eventually that came in and to, to get it, and you know, one was the, with Mark Cuban. Yep. Um, and I think it was he was with Jim Crane, I think. Yes. Um, and then there was Nolan's group. So we got asked about it a lot, and no one was around a lot, and it was like, who would you rather get it? I'm like, whoever's willing to throw down to get players. That's who we want to get it. And, you know, at the time, I think everyone kind of felt obligated to say we would like to see Nolan get it. At the same time, we knew full well the owner that the Mavs had. I'm like, if he gets it, I'm down, man. Like, so, <laughs> but we couldn't really say it publicly, right? Yeah. So um, that was kind of a tough one. That's the only, the only way it made it tough. I think the only people, the guys who had been around a little bit and were somewhat familiar with the process, I think we were all kind of like elbowing each other to say like, man, if Cuban got this thing, it would be pretty sick. Um, because we had a feeling no one was going to be around either way. Right. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, turned out to be fine, but uh, yeah, there's still always a little curious on what would happen if, if Mark Cuban would have gotten a hold of the Rangers. The, it, for me and Ben, you know, we were at ESPN at the time, and we were at Cowboy Camp. And this is the early days of Twitter. And we're following the bankruptcy proceedings happening in real time in the lobby of the hotel we're staying at for Cowboy Camp. And there's all these, you know, media people around us. And we're just watching Twitter waiting for an update because it went into like midnight. It went well into the night when it finally happened. And then to think not too long after all that, you guys are going to your first World Series. It was a really insane time to not only be in media, but just be covering y'all's team in particular because y'all had magic in a bottle and then you guys also had Wash, which was one of the most unique characters in all of sports. Yeah, we had Jackie Moore too. Don't forget about him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jackie. That's a that's a Dude. but that's a really insane time to think back towards. Yeah, it was crazy. Um and at the time, like you said, we were trying to like Ken said, we knew going into that year we had a really good team. I think every year before that we knew we were good, but we had been around long enough to know a lot of things got to go right for right. us. Because if you just go guy for guy, we felt like, hey, you would never say this, but like angels have an edge guy for guy. So we're like, well, if you know this dude gets hurt, this guy over here has a career year, we got a shot. Going to 2010, we're like, we don't have to play that game anymore. We just stay healthy. We're rolling people. And then we made the trade for Cliff, and it was it was on. But So, yeah, we were watching that thing, too, because Cliff was watching it, and he would talk about it openly like because he was about to be a free agent. And to Ken's point, he was like, this place is hot, man. <laughs> <laughs> We'd say it all the time. It's hot, you know? And everyone said it. I mean, I think Roy Halliday was about to be a free agent. And I, like, talked to him. I was like, hey, man, what do you – but he cut me off. He's like, no. 
<laughs> wow. No, not a shot. Like, it's not going to happen. We just couldn't get people to come here. It was it was a losing battle, man. Uh, Ian, do you have a favorite Jackie Moore story? Uh, yeah. I, I, one just came to mind. Yeah? Yeah. He uh, his, his workout, his daily workout was... <laughs> <laughs> Remember what we it called was just it? Exceptional. Remember what we called it? I don't know. He's bouncing on that ball. I don't. Yeah. Know. Then he'd walk around the morning track, and we Wait, called ball, it oh, yeah. "Follow the Boiler." <laughs> follow the boiler. <laughs> <laughs> he'd go to the weight room. He'd sit on a yoga ball. Okay. He would sit on a yoga ball, and he'd grab like fifteen pound dumbbells, and he'd just start bouncing up and down. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just in front of the mirror, just bouncing up and down. And we're like, "What is Jackie doing? Uh, that, that's got to be was, good." It was a scene. You yeah, know? we would try, but like this, this is good for my bum, but I don't think it's <laughs> making me very strong. And then, meanwhile, down the down right down the hall, you have like Marlboro Reds smoke coming out with Snoop, <laughs> and there's Wash with Ja Rule. Yeah. <laughs> And we're like, look at this room right now, man. It was, it, you're right. It was a total scene. It was a scene. There'd be people like, why, like, people. And then Clint like, Hurdle comes, comes basing through, basing through. He had this uh. thing out of this thing was in this microphone was in his vocal cords. Right. You could hear him like, uh, yeah, you could hear him everywhere. I remember being in surprise the first time, or at least for us. Uh, Clint walked in and started bellowing like that, and everyone, I was like, "Oh my God, who yeah. is this person?" Yeah, he had a presence, and it was so different from Wash's presence. Yeah, yep, I would agree with that. They're both uh, different dudes. I think kind of that made that's what made that team really cool, though. A lot of different guys, man. A lot of different dudes. All right, we have Michael Young and Ian Kinsler here. We're talking old times. We're talking new times. It's the Ben and Skin Show. Uh, we're we're going to have to take a break in a second, but I would love to get your thoughts before we do this, Ian. Uh, he had mentioned Cliff. What were you thinking specifically? You guys are midway through the year when you added Cliff to the rotation. Championship. Yeah? Yeah. That was a lockdown. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was like, this is this is what we were supposed to do. This is the move we were supposed to make. And I don't know if you remember then, uh, the media coverage over the over the uh, trade deadline wasn't as you know, uh, thing. It wasn't at, at your fingertips as it is now. Right. So we would get to the ballpark every day, and there's this packet. There's like a packet of papers that gets printed out um, of all the news across the country, and you sit down and yeah. you read about what's going on. Right. Yeah. And so every day we're around like this little packet of white paper trying to figure out who we're trading for. Who are we getting? Are we going to get Cliff? Are we in the mix for Cliff? What are we going to have to trade to get this guy? Um, and then we finally, you know, heard the news break and it was like, all right, it's on. We're, yeah. It's time to go. So it's, you know, us being on the media side and we kind of snuck into the media game. We're not typical journalists, obviously, as you guys know. And you're talking about print media and you're trying to see who what the rumors are. At that time, are you are you believing what you're reading? Or are you going? These are media guys; they don't really know what's happening. Or what are you what are you thinking about? I'll start with you, Michael. A combination of the two. Uh, at that point, you kind of understand who the sources are. Um, some are usually spot on. Some are far from spot on. So we would kind of take everything with a bit of a grain of salt. But Kins is right. There's been this stapled white packet of papers, and we'd flip them all, and we go through everything. And um, you know, I remember at at the time we knew the Clint the Cliff stuff was starting to pick up steam because we started getting. Some front office guys would kind of wander over to Ken's and I. He's like, would you trade uh, this guy for Cliff Lee? And we're like, if you don't trade him, we'll kill you on the spot. <laughs> like, get him out of here. And, and at the time, it was some kids in the minor leagues. And by the way, it could have been the next – it could have – Adrian Beltran, we'd have been like, get him out of here. Like, right. we need Cliff Lee right now. So right. we were saying, ship everybody out, bring in Cliff Lee, and let's give this thing a, a, a run. So – Meanwhile, Justin Smoke was a couple lockers down. Like, sorry, Smokey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really, you can go orca hunting in Puget Sound. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny too because I'm sure as you guys were reading those packets leading up, there was a lot of media that had him going to the Yankees for that, like until the very end, and then like 36 hours before, it's like, oh, he's not. Cliff going thought there. he was going there. Yeah, Cliff thought he was going there. I think CC called him and said, "We just got you." Wow. And then we threw in a couple, Whoa. yeah, we threw in like I another guy or something like that, and uh, the tide shifted. Oh my gosh. God, I love all this old stuff. All right, it's the Ben and Skid Show 97 won The Freak. It's a special day because we have Michael Young and Ian Kinsler, Ranger Royalty, in studio with us. And Ian, you're hearing White Stripes return cuts, Lil' Jack White. Uh, tell all the people listening that may not know, you've got a very unique partnership 
with Jack White. Yeah, give us, we own give a, us some details. We own a uh, baseball bat company together. I mean, it's not a baseball. It, we do we do all kinds of stuff. It's called War Stick. It's a company called War Stick. We have a headquarters down in Deep Elm. Um, this started in, well, my relationship with Jack started before this, you know, venture took place um, in Detroit. He's a huge Detroit Tigers fan. Uh, grew up watching them. He's a, I don't know. He's kind of he's a little quirky. Loves the number three. Huh. He's got a bunch of clocks in his living room. Uh, a bunch, I mean, like fifty, uh-huh. and they're all set to three o'clock. Wow! And he's got like the third man records. Yes. you know, so like three's his his lucky number. Um, and I was I just happened to be wearing number three in Detroit, so he kind of grab you know gravitated towards me. And uh, we met in BP one year and kind of hit it off. And then. You know, two years later, I got approached by a guy named Ben Jenkins here in Dallas um, to invest in a, this baseball bat company called Warstick. And uh, he was pitching me and brought up the name Jack White. And I said, I, I know the guy. Let me see if how interested he really was in this product. And um, I emailed him because he doesn't have a phone. He doesn't do phones. So I emailed the dude. He gets back to me right away. And he said, hey, you guys should fly out to Nashville and pitch this whole thing. Let's talk about it. And we went out there and boom, he, he, uh, he invested in the company along with myself and it's been, it's been a lot of fun ever since. When, uh, when you got to Detroit and got to meet Jack, were you already a white stripes fan or did you become like a bigger fan after getting to know him? I was a white, I was a fan of the music. Yeah. I didn't know it was, I didn't know who was singing the music. I just knew I liked the music. Oh, cool. Yeah. So to put those pieces together and understand what I'm listening to and then obviously at the time he was doing his own music the, the whole white stripes thing had, had ended right and now he's doing his own music and learning about all of that and then getting into the concert scene and seeing him perform is pretty crazy so it's it, it's been a lot of fun it's really cool from our end because we're obviously fans of you we're fans of uh you know the, the team of that era but I'm a big music head, so I was already a fan of Jack White and everything he had done, especially if you, I'm sure you've seen the movie by now, but uh, It Might Get Loud, oh, yeah. the documentary with him and Jimmy Page and, and uh, The Edge, and it's just like, he's such a unique, interesting guy, and when I found out y'all were doing stuff together, I was like, I really like that, because those are two people that I really <clears throat> like. Yeah, and he's a, he's a baseball historian. I mean, this guy knows a lot about the game of baseball. He knows a lot about the history of the game. Uh, he follows the Tigers pretty closely. He follows the league very closely. And, you know, we have a whole text thread where he's constantly throwing back, you know, old school hi- historic uh, baseball trivia. And he, he loves baseball. So it's it's a cool relationship. The guy you referenced, Ben Jenkins, I love too. One of the sharpest marketing people I've ever met. Like, I love that dude. Super creative. All right, Michael Young, Ian Kinsler joining us today in studio, in person. There's a bunch of names that I want to throw at you and have you guys riff on it. Just get your thoughts. And one of them, uh, you know, we were excited about this, Adrian Beltre going into the Hall of Fame. And we knew you guys were going to be on with us, so we'll start with you, Michael. When when I bring up Adrian Beltre, what do you think of? Now I think of a, a, a Hall of Famer. And, you know, it's hard to put into words, like, how happy you are for somebody when something like this happens, right? Um, and, you know, getting a chance to play with them up close, you you – you see, I think that old saying is like, what you do in private for, you get rewarded in public. So everyone sees the kind of player he is, but when you see the preparation, you see everything that goes into, you know, what makes these guys great players. And I say the same thing about Ken's is it's kind of fun to, to see it all come out and, you know, to see how happy he was. Adrian does his, does the best he can to kind of keep his emotions in a little bit. Uh, but you can tell like how, how awestruck he was about this whole thing. You know, baseball hall of fame is a pretty special place. And, you know, when you see like what he's done, you see how his numbers stack up against other third basemen in the history of the game. Uh, it, it, he's right there with these like legends of the game, and it's it's pretty cool to see it all kind of happen, see the end of his career. And um, man, I'm just super excited for the guy. It's so well deserved. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go through some other names. Do you want to say something about Adrian? I would love Legend. to get your thoughts, sir. Legend. He's the best third baseman ever, in my opinion. Really? Yeah. What, do you remember a moment there where you're like, oh, my God. Or did you guys play in the league? You see him play. Did you already know before he got to the Rangers, obviously? Or no. did you learn more? You know, you learn. You, well, when he was in Seattle, he was a good player. Um, and I hit the ball at third base a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of times I was one for four instead of two for four with an extra double because he took it away from me. So um, – I noticed how good he was because normally you hit a ball off the bat, you know how well you hit it, you know what place you hit it in, and it's supposed to be a double down the line, and it turns into an out. You you notice that guy over there, right? Um, 
but he wasn't he wasn't uh he was still a special player but he he was kind of he was good. Uh, he was, was kind of like gr- yeah. grinding through the team. The team yeah. wasn't very good. Yeah. He was, you know, hitting in the middle, um, you know, year to year. He was like borderline all star. And then he got to Texas and just kind of t- well, he went to Boston first. Mm-hmm. He played that year in Boston, and went crazy. Mm-hmm. And then the Rangers came in and signed him. He went right in the middle of our lineup. We had a really good clubhouse, and he just took off. Um, and you know, I think Elvis brought out a lot in him. You know, Elvis really they were like brothers, and they they he brought out a lot of you know, of that youth, that youth that you see, the, the energy that he has, Elvis brought that out of him. So, you know, he, for me, just the things that he did on the field defensively were, it was just so dynamic, man. This guy, I, I didn't play against, I played against, you know, third basemen that were really good. And I played maybe against Scott Rowland a little bit. Um, you know, Evan Longoria was always really good over there. You know, Manny Machado is really good, but Adrian is just, he was just on a different level. He just, it seemed like he he just never made a mistake. And yeah. no cup, no cup, no cup. He he did take a <laughs> he took one off the twig and berries in Seattle. The, that, speaking of press clippings, we had the white paper one time, and we're we're going we go to Seattle, and it's like uh, it, I love when they write stuff in print. I'm like, how do you like not put like ha 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 when you write some of this <laughs> stuff? It's like Adrian Beltre won't play. He has a testy the size of a grapefruit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. I don't know if he's if he's injured or dead. <laughs> Someone go check on him. This sounds terrible. How do you not wear a cup after that? Because he's an insane human being. Man. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he, he was the best. I never seen a better defender. Um, you know, for third baseman, you look at like to me like the best like hitter is like Chipper Jones to me like really sticks out. Like that guy was a special hitter. But like in terms of the whole package, I've never seen someone in like defensively like Adrian. He was he was born to play third base. The the bit of okay, you can't touch his head. He's gonna go after. You. Did you guys ever touch his head? Yeah, that was real. <laughs> that was real. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's real. Like if you, hey Adrian, no, and you yeah. rub his head, what happens? No, to you? you know, like Mike doesn't like clowns. Yeah, yeah, same. That's thing. That's real. It's real. Did you ever try it? Childhood Ian? experience. This is trauma we're talking about. <laughs> okay. Really? Yeah. yeah. What yeah, does Mike, it go back to? I don't know. I wasn't. I, we I, all I, know. I didn't, didn't want to. Oh, for me or for Adrian. Well, either one. I, I, I mentioned the clown. Let's not talk about me. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So Adrian, no, Adrian, Adrian I don't that's, know. That's I the just, whole thing. It was yeah. Elvis. Elvis was always the one sneaking up on him, snagging his helmet, and then rubbing it and bouncing behind somebody else. Somebody else is getting murdered. <laughs> yeah. Someone else is getting hit in the chest, and yeah. Elvis is laughing in the corner drinking water. Yeah. But, He's uh he, yeah. He, it was definitely a real thing. He hated it, man. You, you touch him in the head, he was in a he was in a stick you, and that would suck. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> it, it was nonstop though. Once you get one of those things that w- if you have something that you know you don't like, you're better off just like gritting your teeth and powering through. You let the cat out of the bag, it's over, man. It's over. Okay, yeah. so people found out you didn't like clowns, Michael. Was that a problem? Or yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> was, how, was yeah. people messing with you with clowns? Yeah, all the time. We were in um, yeah, here in Texas, it got it got to be like a lot. Um, but then I went to Philly. And I never forget they had it was the stupidest thing ever. You know, they had Barnum and Bailey Day, and I remember I'm like, this is the stupidest day you can think of. We go out to the dugout, and it's like I usually get to the dugout early. So for a seven o'clock game, I'm out there like at six thirty, six thirty-five. I'm usually the only one, or someone else is there. I go down there, and the entire Philadelphia Philly roster is in there like this, looking at me, <laughs> staring at me. I'm like, what's, go- what's going on? I look out, and it's exactly what you think it'd be. Some just idiot, the white face and stupid flower, you know, and the <laughs> stupid nose. And Like, what are you trying to hide, bro? Like, this is already <laughs> pissing me off. And then, like, they're all just laughing. And then all of a sudden, they, I don't know if they, they, they spotted a dude at 20 to come over and try and, like, rub my shoulder. And I, I, I think I elbowed that guy. <laughs> and then I went to stretch, and... Um, and I usually kind of shut my eyes and try and visualize. And I, I, I open my eyes, and this dude with the stupid shirt and the stupid face and the stupid nose and the stupid flower, <laughs> stupid hair, <laughs> stupid aura is staring at me within twelve inches of my face. Oh no! Oh! And I, I, I got mad at the strength coach because he was right there and didn't tell me. I'm like, hey, whose who side you on here, bro? You know, like so I was <laughs> super pissed. And I told the, I told the clown, I'm like, hey man, like I, I know you think hey, this man. is like a bit, but like I know you can hear me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm getting really pissed right now. Like you need to give me my space, or I'm, I'm gonna just, you're, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead, clown walking. If you keep doing this. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little 
Yeah. You even get mad <laughs> talking about it. So bad. Yeah. I've never heard the phrase dead clown walking. Yeah. This has been yeah, a special no. day. It's a good yeah. name for a band. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if he didn't leave, you would have heard it about the next day in your white clips, bro. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, all right, Michael Young, Ian Kinsler with us in studio. Uh, this is so much fun. Uh, I want to ask you guys about Josh Hamilton. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about a lot of things, but I'd love to know if you have a favorite Josh Hamilton story, first of all. But, um, Ian, when you, when you first – or was there a moment where you were watching Josh Hamilton and you're like, oh, dear Lord, this is this guy's a special talent? Yeah, day one. I didn't <clears throat> I, I didn't watch Cincinnati Red, Reds games the year before. I didn't know too much about this guy. I didn't know about his history. Um, I knew he was the first pick, and then it was just kind of went away. I didn't, I didn't know the whole story. Um, and I, I knew he was performing well in Cincinnati. There was some – you know, you see highlights every once in a while, but nothing that I was paying attention to. And we trade for the guy. He comes over first day in spring training. We're in the cage. And just the sound off his bat is different than anybody I've ever played with. It, it's it's incredible. I played with a lot of really good players. Uh, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, Ter- Fernando Tatis, Miguel Cabrera, Adrian Beltre. I mean, all these, you know, guys, Hall of Fame type dudes. Um and it was just different. Like Shohei, Shohei maybe gets close, but it, Josh. Every every stadium we went to uh, during back, batting practice, he would hit he would hit a ball somewhere where we would all just kind of like stop and just stop what we were doing and be like, well, "How does I, that doesn't it doesn't compute? It doesn't add up where he was hitting balls in BP." Um, in, insane talent. How uh, how quickly into him joining the clubhouse and being a part of your team did you guys know, okay, he's got this past and maybe we need to treat him different, or did you even treat him different? We did. I, I would say we, 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 we acted different around him. We didn't yeah. treat him differently, I guess you can say. Um, but, yeah, it, it was he was a different, different guy, man. I remember that we were in played interleague in Cincinnati in 2007, and I'll never forget, man, like he was he was wearing sleeves, first of all. Right. And I remember I was talking to someone on the Reds and I went, who's that? Right. This is guy walking around. He had sleeves on so you couldn't see his tattoos. OK. Right. So um, that would have been a dead giveaway. And they're like, oh, that's Josh Hamilton. I'm like, oh, that's right. That's right. I'm like, look at that dude. Like Josh is one of those guys like he walks on a baseball field. You're like, whoa. Yeah. You know, six four, two forty, fastest guy in the field. Right. It's he's a freak. And. You know, we get he gets in our our locker room, and you know, and one thing that really stuck out is like Josh didn't do, like we would like study pitchers, try and get our edges everywhere. Josh was like, dude, just throw the white thing my way, and I'll handle the rest. Like he wasn't into <laughs> any of that, you know, nothing. And just as far as talent goes, like I, best way I can put it is, you have Adrian Kins, you have Nap, you have the, some, uh, you know, Nelly, some really talented great players with great careers and none of us felt like we can hold a candle to him especially talent wise it's a different level different level than the guy and i want to ask about this because i mean and it may not be a simple answer but there's uh the physical ability which is unique but then there's the mental ability right was his physical ability just so vast that he didn't have to think about whatever was going on or did he also have an exceptional eye or, or something of that nature i just think he was bigger faster stronger in the game yeah honestly. oh wow and and he had he had baseball instincts like he had incredible instincts yeah um and i don't think he real he just, he was just like he's it was just instinctual he didn't think about what was going on if it if there's a blooper over the second baseman's head he knew right away that's falling. I'm going to third. I'm using my speed, and he's just flying. And you're like, dude, how did he doesn't? He's not supposed to know that, right? You know, he's six four. He's not supposed to run the bases that way. He's got size eighteen feet. He's ripping dirt up. It's just, he sounds like a it's running joke. back running around the bases. He's just like, what is going on? I I can remember in spring training, we were running uh, before practice started. We were doing our conditioning, and we were running you know sixty yard sixty yard sprints. And we were all going 80%. You know, it's super early in the morning, spring training. We're not going crazy fast. But Josh is beating me every time. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, and this is all internal dialogue. I'm like, all right, I'm going to beat him every time from here on out. So I get up on the line, take off running. He beats me again. 
And I'm like, what in the world? Like, I didn't say that out loud. I swear <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. We get on the line again. I'm like, okay, this time he's definitely not beat. I'm, I wasn't slow, okay? Yeah. So I take off running. Dude beats me again. I'm like, what is going on? He doesn't even know that I'm racing, and he's beating me. <laughs> it was embarrassing. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Joke. Me too. Uh, okay, let's talk about Mike Napoli. You mentioned I'd love to get your favorite Napoli story. When I bring up Mike Napoli, I see smiles. You love the man. <laughs> you know, you, re- you remember the Napoli chants. Yeah. So, Michael, what comes to mind when you start thinking of Nap? He's a, he's an absolute beauty. Um, I miss that guy. Um, I'm trying to think of a good Nap story. Um, I think I, he definitely marched the beat of his own drum. Um, but he was a really great teammate. You know, like he in in Nap was like um, he was a gamer man. Like when it's when it's usually in a locker room right around six fifteen, it the vibe changes. Right, the game is around the corner. Guys start getting their uniforms on. It's it, the vibe changes. Nap would be like full uniform at like five forty five, ready to go. And he was like that a lot. Um, uh, you know, was, I, I hate to bring this up, but I, it's fresh in my mind because someone asked me about it with Adrian uh, like last week. And then after 2000, you know, me and the team had a rough off season going in 2011. Uh, we get to spring training. Everything's like, whatever, let's just put this behind. Let's play ball. So I go to Adrian and I knew it'd be awkward for Adrian and maybe even potentially for Nap because Nap was a time maybe going to get some at bats at DH. Mm-hmm. So I go to Adrian and I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, just so you know, like this, don't worry about this. This is all re- dumb stuff. We've already squashed it. Let's just move on, play ball. And Adrian's like, wow, good. Because you can tell Adrian was kind of thinking about it. So right there, boom, squash with Adrian. We're done. Um, and then I said, uh, I go to nap. I'm like, Hey, what's up? He goes, Hey, you know, we played against Anaheim all the time. Yeah. So, uh, I'm like, Hey, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, just go play ball. You're with a new team. Don't, don't sweat anything like it. We're all cool here. So don't worry about it. He goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this was like, it was news in the base baseball world. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> just zero clue. Zero. And like, I, and it, some guys, you know, it's weird. Like some guys, like scream, like they're rumored to be good teammates, right? I'll never forget. We were at probably about two months into that year, and Nap wasn't playing much at all. Your uh, Your Vitoriabo was our was our catcher, and Nap was basically his backup. And at that point, we knew how good Nap was, um, and he never said a word. He just kept working. He's like, and you could see he's like, my, my time's going to come. My time's going to come. My time's going to come. And then when it did, it was game over. Like we kind of really saw how great he was, but never said a word. And he never missed any kind of early work. He was always the first one, like congratulating guys on like a job well done. Um, but as a teammate, that guy was off the charts, man. Just incredible. Did you know that from the beginning with him? Because if I remember correctly, didn't he get traded to, I think, Toronto and then boomeranged back here? Because I don't think Anaheim wanted us to get him. No. <clears throat> and, and did you know Napoli? I mean, y'all compete. What did you know about him? That I didn't like him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This guy plays for the Angels. I hated the Angels. Right. Everything about him. Um, and Nap was right in the middle of a lot of it. Yeah. You know? And it's one of those things when you're when you're being competitive and you're on the field and you're playing to win and there's a team that's you, – you guys are fighting for the same thing. Um, a lot of times you you end up not liking people that you probably do. And, you know, if you, if you knew them personally right. off the field, you end up – they actually end up being, you know, becoming one of your best friends or best teammates or whatever. And Nap was that way. You know, when he first showed up, it was awkward. It was uh, a little weird to have him in the locker room. It happened so quickly. He went to Toronto and then all of a sudden he's with the Rangers. And <clears throat> I can remember we were all fired up about getting him because we knew he was a really good player. But we knew it was like, this is going to be awkward for him. Probably a little bit awkward for us. We were tight. You know, we were a tight knit group. And you're bringing in this Angels catcher who mm-hmm. kind of acts like a jerk on the field, you know? Like He brawled with him. I mean, yeah. it was – how's this going to work? Yeah. yeah. He didn't act like a jerk. He just – you know, his his, his presence is kind of cocky, right? Yes. Um, but Nap was Nap, – Nap was a glue guy for sure. Uh, funny, funny thing about him, though, is that he was scared to death of catching pop flies when he was playing first base. If there, if there was anything up in the air that went – to the right side of the diamond, he he would come over to me, just eyes wide open, just you could just like smell the anxiety. <laughs> and he's like, "If the ball goes up, just you you get it, okay?" <laughs> <laughs> like I got you, bro. But he ended up playing some left field. It was it was worse at first than it, it was wasn't. only first base. Really? 
Really? Yeah, it was only first base. Oh my I don't God. know if it was because he was so close to the coaches or like. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know what was going on. I so distinctly remember. I want to say one more quick thing about Napoli. And I got to ask you guys this. We asked for an hour of your time and we have so much more. Is there? Do you guys have a tea time or would you stay? You'll no, stay. no, we're good. Oh, yes! you guys are incredible. Yeah. Uh, I, but I want to mention this right quick. I very much remember, I can't remember the game or the the, the series, but when uh, Vladdy was over and right, I remember every time a ball was hit to right, you went over there and got it. Yeah. <laughs> you were covered that Vladdy's hole. Vladdy's knees were shot. Man. <laughs> Poor guy, man. Poor uh, guy. But I want to say this about, about Napoli. My lasting memory of him is actually in Boston, that one image of him walking down the street in the middle of the night shirtless after they won the World Series. There's it, a great backstory we can talk about offline on that one, too. <laughs> oh. I want to ask you guys about your favorite athlete in general. Um, and, Michael, I think your favorite athlete is Kobe, and I'm not positive. Is that accurate? Yeah. that's that, that's It was uh, Magic Johnson for the longest time and then went to Kobe, yeah. What do you sure. What do you love about Kobe? You know what I mean? Since he's since his passing, I mean, like a lot of things that you know, it's weird when you retire too. A lot of things that you didn't do so great kind of get erased, and people focus on your strengths. Um, but I mean, as far as like the stuff, like I always love gravitate to athletes. It just like you can feel how much they want to compete. It's gonna go their way. You know, if you're really good, it's gonna go your way a lot. Sometimes it's not. Um, but anytime, like I've watched a lot of Laker games, you know, and anytime it's time to go, like you know. Are they going to win? Are they going to lose? I don't know. But that guy's like coming to play tonight. He's going to give you everything he's got that night. So I enjoyed watching that. That By far, that's the thing that sticks out the most for them. That makes me think about a couple things. Uh, number one, you have a friendship with Dirk. And Dirk and Kobe had the Mutual Admiration Society. And that was based on the fact that Kobe knew, saw that same thing in Dirk that you're talking about. It's in Kobe. It's like that game recognized game thing where that's the most important thing and the prep that goes in and and all that stuff. But I only, I'm assuming you've seen The Muse. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just saw it recently. Oh, wow. And watching it after he's passed, because the movie came out when he was, you know, right at, you know, he was still getting ready to retire. He was still, you know, wrapping up his career. And to see it after he passed, it just hit me in a way different way than I'm sure it would have if I saw it at the time it came out. It's, it's really insane that, he lived the life he lived and, and impacted so many people, and now he's he's gone. It's such yeah. a crazy thing to think about. Yeah, the, I still kind of it's it's very odd, especially like in L.A. where he was a larger than life guy, right? I mean, uh, and when he his passing was like everyone out out there just and I text from friends out there and they're like, it was like a really really big thing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it still is. And you see guys that go out of their way all the time. Every time I, I can't go anywhere when I, I'm out there, where it doesn't matter where I'm at in Southern California, where I don't see a mural every other block. I mean, they're everywhere out there, which is super cool. Ian, do you have a favorite that comes to mind, a favorite athlete, anybody that inspired you when you were younger or as a player? Anybody come to mind? That's a really tough question because I, I watched a lot of sports growing up. So there's a flood of athletes that come to mind when I think about my favorite athlete. But, um, you know, one that really stands out, my dad kind of is a big fan of this guy. I kind of pushed him on me when I was a kid. I never really got that. I, I got to see him fight, but he was already at the end of his career. It was Muhammad Ali. And, you know, he this dude transcend time. Like, he he was, you know, politically just the whole the whole era that he was um, on top of the mountain, right? And And the things that he did. Um, the things that he stood up for while he is being the world champion is just absolutely impressive to me. It's just he's a, he's a uh, incredible human being. So um, I would I would probably say Muhammad Ali. That's a good one. Me and Ben are old enough to have watched his cartoon in the seventies. <laughs> yes, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a Muhammad Ali cartoon. Wow. You you mentioned your dad there, and so I, I've 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 never asked you about this, and Ben and I have met your dad many times. Uh, it's just so interesting. I'm wondering what your life was like growing up. I'm assuming your dad was a, dis a disciplinarian only because I know that your dad worked in a correctional facility. Yeah, he was a, he was a prison warden and he was definitely the disciplinarian. My, my mom's an angel, so, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, spending a whole day at a maximum security prison and coming home, um, there were some, some unpleasant days. You know, if there's right. a, just one crumb on the counter, I'm cleaning the whole damn thing. So it was, you know, it, but but it's taught me a lot um, as far as sports is concerned and mentality of how to play sports and 
what to expect of yourself. And, and he, he was also a, a minor in psychology in college. So he was oh, a, wow. a criminal uh, major and then uh, minored in psychology. So he, he had a way about it. And, and, you know, he benched me at times when I was a kid for small things um, that he didn't agree with. And, you know, I wore it, but it was all worth it for sure. Yeah. So I, I grew up on Rangers baseball and, you know, my dad would take me out there at Arlington skin too. And it was just not a very good franchise for a long time, but I didn't know any better. They were my team. And I was like, wait, people still play in October. Why? Are, I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> and then, uh, you guys came, came along and took us on the greatest stretch, uh, in terms of, you know, obviously they just won the world series, but the greatest stretch in the history of the team a lot of winning and a lot of what we talked about, a lot of champagne popping. You guys took us on an incredible journey. And there's so many Rangers fans listening to this. They're loving it. We're seeing the feedback. and But people are asking, okay, now you you are on this front office staff. You're assistants to the general manager, to Chris Young. So you're there. We see you up in you know the suite with the team officials at all these games. I know you're smack dab in the middle of it again. But people are asking, okay, did this championship help those two guys being there a little bit in terms of, you know, you guys got so close in 2010 and 2011, but did this help at all? Winning. You want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. You can take it first. So, like, the correct thing to say is yes, right? <laughs> but it didn't It didn't help at all. Yeah. Like, these are two different things, right? We're, we were competitors at the time, and it's always going to be, a, a you know, a sour taste uh, from what happened in 2010 and 11, but – um, you know, we're in a completely different role now. This is a completely different team and they're, they're accomplishing their own things. We're on the outside looking in and this is, this is a different ride, right? Um, that'll, it'll never change it. People ask me, does winning in Boston in 2018 change? No, it doesn't change it. Like it, that's, that's the history of, of the career and the teammates that I played with and those teams. That's the, that's the history. Um, does it, change it for the fans do i see the fan base change yes and that's where the joy comes in where it's like they finally this city this metroplex finally has a champ a baseball championship and to be able to ride in the parade and see their response and see you know the excitement and the joy man it's it's a good feeling right and that's where it's that's where it's different that's where it's healing a little bit um is seeing the fan base just enjoy it so much you want to add to that yeah i, th I think ken's nailed that one like i uh I think it's great for the fans because um, I feel like that weight is now off their shoulders, right? They they have their title. They have – I know like when they, you know, you know, the Cowboys won their first one a long, long time ago. When the Mavs won their, their title, I'm sure the basketball fans in this area, like we have our championship. And I'm sure our baseball fans here feel the same way. They have their title now, right? They It's no longer, you know, when were we going to become world champions? They have it now. It'll, it'll never – that flag will never come down. For us, um, I get a lot, like like Ken said, I get a lot of joy of seeing the fans' excitement out of the organization's excitement. All of everyone's hard work paid off. Obviously, throw for the players and the staff. But for us, like, no. Um, that pain is still there. I think, like you said, it helps with the healing a little bit, but that's okay. Like, I don't say that to, to pout or complain. That's what you deal with, like, as an as an athlete. Like, you, you risk getting your sports heart smashed and stepped on. That's part of it. You know, um, we had a lot of great moments that we're super proud of, um, you know, but to not get it done. Yeah. Does it hurt? Yeah. Will it always hurt? Sure. At the same time, I don't think about it as often as I did right after my retirement or say in 2012. Um, but when I do, it feels the same, if that makes sense. And I, I don't think that's just for us. I think it's for any athlete. I mean, you guys mentioned Dirk. I remember one time we were talking and I mentioned the, uh, the Baron Davis series, right? When right. they were the number one seed. And he looked at me like, Dude, like, what? Why, why are you bringing that up right, right. now? Right? I'm like, wait, you you won one, like you won, and it didn't matter. Like that pain is still there. So it doesn't matter if you if you won one. I remember we lost to the Giants, and I got a text. Uh, you know, Derek Jeter sent me a text like, Dad, it's, I know losing is tough. I'm like, dude, you've won five. I don't, I don't want to hear. It, right? <laughs> it didn't matter. Like losing at this level is like it's brutal, and it stays with you forever. It doesn't matter if you won, lost. Doesn't matter. It it's it's tough, and it never really goes away. When you were talking about the freshness of it, did it get in the way in 2012 and 2013? Like, when are you able to compartmentalize that? Because I, I get it. It's trauma, yeah. right? Trauma stays with you forever. <laughs> and then over time, you're able to, to deal with trauma. But did it get in the way right after 2011? I think everyone has their opinions on this one. Mine is that, yes. 
And that, we didn't know it at the time. You know, when you when you remove yourself, you get a little more of a bird's eye view of things. I my opinion is, yeah, that stayed with us after 2012, or excuse me, during 2012, because we still had a great team, mm -hmm. um, and we had another great year. But I think that just uh, the emotion of the whole thing hadn't hadn't worn off. We were still eating; it was eating at us every single day. Um, now we still had a chance to go out and, and play well, make a run that year too. It didn't happen, but I personally think that yeah, I, I think it stayed with us a little bit during that season too. <clears throat> yeah, putting it like you said, putting it in compartments. You know, when you're when you're trying to perform every single day, and you're in the 2012 season, yeah, it's not it's not really bothering you, right? Um, when you look back on what what happened that season and how everything took place, it 100% affected us. Yeah. You know, it affected us going into spring training that year. It affected us towards the end of the season. Um, you know, everybody's attitude changed just a little bit, and that's enough. At that level, when you're playing, you know, at the highest level, you you have a little bit of uh, edge taken away for whatever reason. It's It just gets harder. So we, you know, one of the cool things about being a Rangers fan is Jamie Newberg. Uh, he teaches the fan base about the minor leagues. And so I was a huge fan of the minor league system and knew so much about all the guys who are up and coming. And I can remember one time I was just talking baseball off the record with you, Ken's, and I was just speaking from my non-baseball experience and I was plotting my course. Here's the lineup, this prospect in the two hole, this prospect in eight, this pro and you were like, whoa, 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 what? What are you doing? I was like, yeah, these prospects that are coming up. And you just heard Michael reference it as like, go get veterans ready to win now. And so I, I would love to get your your thoughts on that in terms of it's easy for a fan to say, plug this prospect in. But until you guys have until you've done it at the major league level, you haven't done it at the major league level, right? Yeah, 100 percent. And that that line's getting more blurred today. Um, you see young players coming up and having huge impacts and, and they always have, but I think it's just more prev prevalent in today's game. But yes, I still, I'm still, uh, I'm still in the bucket of you, you have to get to the big leagues. You have to experience every day and it's a, it, it's relentless, right? It never gives up on it. In the minor leagues, you might have a day or two where you're like, man, I'm facing this guy again. I'm going to eat this guy's lunch. I'm going to get three or four hits today. That never happens in the big leagues. It is every day. You have to get prepared. You have to be ready to play because, if you're not the guy on the mound or the other team, you're you're gonna get you're gonna get punished. Um, so until you experience that and you know how to react to that and you know how to prepare and you change all of the you know loose end or you you know sure up the loose ends, it takes it takes a year. Some guys are some guys it happens fast, right? And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think like I said at the beginning, the the lines getting a little bit more blurred. I think the the younger players are more prepared to come up. Um, but I'm still a believer that, you mm -hmm. know, you got to experience this thing. And and so if you bring that back to this this team, uh, Evan Carter, obviously you said that line's getting blurry. And Evan Carter had an immediate impact. And Wyatt Langford has a chance to have an immediate impact. So now I ask you guys to put on your front office hats and, and talk to us about this. And so, Michael, what makes Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford, each of those guys or either of those guys, unique in that regard to be ready to go now? Yeah, I mean, Evan's... Man, I think the biggest thing is you have a, a really advanced approach for such a young kid. Um, it's pretty rare that a kid can come up from being just turning 21 and come up and like control the strike zone as well as he does. That's a that's a timeless skill. And if you can control the strike zone, you can swing your strikes, and you have you can you know stick the ball in the barrel a lot. You're going to be a good hitter. Um, and he's like, there's a lot more there. He runs well. He's instinctive. He plays defense well at all three positions, and he's going to tap into more power. But again, I mean, I think one reason why we love Evans, we knew what we had in the minor leagues, but we didn't know how he'd perform when he got here. Just like you don't know how anybody would perform when they get here. And then look, you're looking what he did. I mean, now you you've earned something, right? So now he's got a he's got a piece of this now. And, you know, he's grabbed it and he's holding on to it. So at that point, you empowered the kid, right? Um, so yeah, I'm I'm of the same camp. Like I'm not saying that there are certain prospects that you see something with. You're like, yeah, we're not going to trade that guy. At the same time, I would never, um, you know, look at that kid or value him at the expense of an established guy who's earned his job because he's gone through the same thing that kid's about to go through. And you want that guy to go out and establish himself so you keep him for a long time. Well, so I'm not going to sit there and bump the guy who's already done it, you know. Um, now, when you get a guy who's a little older, you know, end of a contract, you know, there's business things to consider. But um, 
you know, going back to the original point, like, yeah, I think Evan now has, has earned a little something, you know, and now Wyatt's got a chance, has that same opportunity. He can go out and earn it. We'll get our first look at him in spring training, at least at the big league level. <clears throat> but it's like crazy athleticism, big, strong, fast, like all the checks, all the fun boxes. So we'll just get him to spring training, cut him loose, see what he's got. How much has your experience as a special advisor working in the front office, and I'll start with you, Ian, changed your changed the way you look at Major League Baseball or your opinion on it, if it has at all? Oh, a good question, because I don't, I don't know if it's changed much. I just learned more, right? As a player, you're very narrow-minded. Mm-hmm. You're just like, today, we go to battle, you know? We're going to win today, and that's really all you're thinking about. You're just trying to get ready for tonight you know, seven o'clock when you step away from it and you have a bigger picture and you have to think years, months, whatever ahead, um, or you, you look at a way a kid moves and trying to predict futures is just absolutely trash. I hate it, but you have to do it right. It's part of the, part of the business. Um, you just, you just learn more. I still, I still think at the end of the day, meat and potatoes of baseball is controlling the strike zone. Like Evan Carter does it. It's like jumping in basketball. You, you can improve it a little bit, but if you have strikes on discipline, it's not. It's just not going to go away. You know, mm-hmm. guys that that have good strikes strikes on discipline are just usually good hitters. Um, but intangibles like that, you look for you look for stuff like that that you know really works at any level. And trying to figure that out, it's different than being a player, right? <laughs> like you're looking for different attributes amongst players. As, as a as a player, you're just looking at your teammate to be a good teammate and to pick you up and to play hard and to help you prepare and you help him prepare. And it's a different dynamic, right? Um, it's a lot of fun. And that, that first year after I finished playing, it was, it was tough. You know, it's tough because you hear, uh, you know, scouts or, or front office personnel talk about one of your ex teammates. And you're like, man, they're talking about me like this. A little <laughs> <laughs> like, Damn. All right. Well, That's harsh. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and you, you, you try to remember how hard the game is, you know, how hard it is to play, and you try to keep that perspective and um, really just just helping kids grow and, and get ready for the big league experience, you know. That's really what it's about. Michael, does Corey Seager remind you of any other players? Good question. Um, no, not, not off the top of my head. Um, you know, one thing that I really, really love about the guy is that you know, you, it's, you don't see too much emotion out of him, right? And that can be taken two different ways, right? Some guys, like, thrive on emotion. Like, Ken's was like that. Like, you know, the more emotion, the better. It'd get him ready to play. I was like, I felt it the same, but I'm like, for me, if I get too emotional, I'm going to lose concentration, if that, if that makes sense. You know, if I get, like, you know, too fired up, my next at bat, I'm going to take some things for granted. Like, I got to, like, one foot in front of the other and keep going. Um, I don't know if Corey reminds me of anybody, but, like, right now he is he – is, the best shortstop in the game. Um, Corey is really, really great. Uh, you know, he's he's absolutely destroyed every level he's ever played and in every point of the year, spring training, during the season, postseason. Um, and the guy, like, when you talk about, like, preparation and, like, grinding through your prep, I mean, Corey is next level. It's like recording every swing he takes, breaking down where his swing is at. He's super aware of where he's at body-wise. And at the end of the day, he really, really gives a damn, and he wants to be as good as he can be. Um, as far as who he reminds me of, I'm not sure. I will say this, man. The guy is, like, ridiculously underrated as a defender, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Most people, like, for all the same stuff, you know, it's like, um, oh, he's 6'4", uh, he's big, and then people start saying, oh, my God, you know, the, I hate, oh, his range and this and that. I'm like, how many people do you know are like going to their backhand, jumping off a trampoline, doing a 360 and throwing people out at first? It does not happen. But Corey's there because he's about three steps to his right when most people aren't because he's smart. If you hit it to shortstop, you are out. And he's he is a just a rock solid defensive shortstop. I mean, it went from like, all right, when's he when he signs, when's he gonna go to third to like no chance this guy moves off short. He is that good defensively. I thought he should have won a gold glove this year. Uh on the final day of the year. If I had told you guys this Ranger team is about to go win a World Series this year, what would you have thought? After everything that happened in that final month of the season, mm, I would have been like, "Well, they got to play the games, I guess." Let's go. Let's go check it out. Let's go, let's would you go have been a believer? Happens. You know, they they showed a lot of resiliency through the year. I knew they were going to be a tough out. You know, I knew they were going to fight. 
um, Bruce Bochy's teams don't just lay down. Yeah. Right. So you knew they were going to, you knew they were going to become prepared. They were going to come to fight. Um, but you just don't just the way the season ended and the bitter taste and all the things, you don't know how teams going to respond to that. And they obviously, you know, now sitting here talking about it, they just responded incredibly. Right. They, they did something that no team has ever done. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's a special group right there. Do you guys, when you're hanging out in the Metroplex, do you, is it hard for you to go places without being recognized, or do, do do people not recognize you? Do they recognize you? Yeah, people are yeah. people are pretty good about it. People they just cool. you know, thanks for I, I appreciate watching you play. You know, nothing nothing crazy. Mm-hmm. People are really cool here on here about that. They, they don't take too much of your time. They come up and it happens a lot. They come up, just say hello, shake a hand, and then that's it. So that's always like really nice. I actually appreciate that. Do I mean, you, I'm assuming you go out a lot more now than you did in your playing days. You're able to, right? Uh, yeah, and we I, have I mean, three schedule. kids for Mike, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> he's in well, bed we, by 8.30. Yeah, if, 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 it, if it's a weekday and it has two numbers, like 10, I'm like, what, what, am, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, shut it down. Unplug the kid. Yeah, but I mean, we, I mean, there's no games, right? So we can go out to dinner a lot more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess in that sense. But, I mean, I, I'm not out at, you know, strange places either, man. I, right. I'm home or I'm chasing kids, basically, or at a golf course. You guys are very competitive human beings, and it, I was even scared to go back and ask the 2010-2011 question for that. I knew I was in dangerous territory, but I'm wondering if that has um, that competitiveness is carried over. Like, I know you guys uh, play some golf. Are, are you hyper-competitive in golf as well? Yeah, but it's yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like only I can only blame myself, you know? It's a very frustrating sport. But, yes, I, I work at it. I work at it a lot and try to get better at it. You know, it's it's a fun sport. It, ri- it reminds me a lot of like going in the cage by yourself and hitting off the tee, and just kind of feeling what your body's doing and try to grind through some things and and you know understand your swing better. That's that's kind of same feeling at the range, and I think that's why I love it. Crazy thing about golf, which I mean, you guys are premier athletes, but what you're doing at 35 is way different at 45, and then way different at 55, and so everything that you think you've practiced. Your body's gonna start changing. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. That it's bad. crazy. All right, I'm just dying to talk about Wash. Uh, there's so much to talk about with him, uh, but where I want to start is when he first got here. How quickly did you guys connect with him, or what did you think, and 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 that whole journey with Wash? I'll start with you, Michael. Pretty much right away. Um, I think we were dying at that point for uh, something new, like a breath of fresh air in the organization. Um, and we obviously, I think we were in the middle of a bit of a rebuild, but we knew we were, if we make some good decisions, we're a couple years away from making some noise. And that's that's what happened. But I mean, his th- the guy is like, uh, it's just so refreshing to be around because he really loves baseball. He loves to coach. Uh, a lot of times with managers, they kind of at that point delegate the coaching part of the game to like the infield guy or to the hitting guy or whatever. He was still like neck deep in it, throwing BP, you know, helping infielders, um, and he loves to compete. Like Wash is a, at, at heart, he's a he's a competitor at heart. Um, you know, I think people like you know see him as this guy who's joking around all the time and messing with players, and that's true. But uh, when it came down to it, and it was time to go out and try and trying to hang a W that night, the guy was all business. So it was again a breath of fresh air is probably the best way to describe him. What do you think? Uh, <clears throat> I connected with Wash probably day two after he was hired, you know, and you get on the phone, you don't know what to expect. Um, I just saw him waving his arm in Oakland. That's all I knew about him. (laughs) Uh, But he came out right away. He told us exactly how it was going to be. We're going to focus on defense. This team needs to get crisp, more crisp defensively. He obviously, you know, the defensive side of the game was his calling card. um, And he stuck that on us right away. Day one of spring training, you know, normally in spring training, you come out, after an at bat, you come out of your game. If you're a, if you're a starting player, you come out in the fourth inning, early in spring training, fifth inning. You after your second at bat, third at bat, you're you're done. You to go take a shower. Well, Wash, he was like, no, you're you're going back on defense because we're getting that extra half inning of defense because we're focusing on defense. And that whether you get a ground ball or not, um, or if anything even happens, the guy goes and punches out three guys in a row, nothing happens. But it's just the the mindset, right? And that's how Wash was. He's a mindset guy, like. Every day you showed up, you knew that he was there to win that game, and he was going to get you prepared, whatever you needed to do. Um, like Mike said, throwing BP, hitting ground balls. He's sweating every day. He's out there for early work. You want extra work, Wash is there. Um, 
and he he was a like Mike said just just a great competitor a great leader uh let us do our thing he would every spring training he'd walk in and you know uh every every year that I was there he would walk in in spring training be giving a speech obviously we're all in stitches whatever we're you know it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster you run one minute you're serious and it's like we're we're going to beat everybody this year that's that's the only thing that matters and then the next minute you're in stitches he's got you rolling but he always said he always repeated the same thing every year he said this is your, this is this is your locker room i don't mm-hmm. i don't i don't need to come up in here this is your locker room. As long as the police department and the fire department don't come in here, <laughs> we're good. And he would he would drop that on us every spring training. But he he had your back as a player. I got thrown out a lot. You know, we've already talked about, you know, I was an emotional player. Um, every single time Wash came out onto the field when I was giving the umpire the business or just p- pissed about something, he would never hold me back. And he would never tell me I was wrong. He never told me. But he would get right in the umpire's face with me. You know, we'd both be screaming at the dude. He'd get tossed, and we'd come back in, and and that was it. He let it roll. I, I want to ask you guys if you have a favorite wash story. I mean, that there's, these are all great, but I mean, for fans, you know, this is behind the scenes stuff that we don't have access to. And is there a story that stands out to you, Michael Young, when you think about wash? There was one story where we had to release a guy. I won't say his name. Um, we had to release a guy, and the and, the, and there were started this little rumor that he, like, w- was super super upset with Wash. So the press goes to ask Wash the next day, "Hey, you know, we heard that guy like knows like, like you know knows how to fight, like knows karate or something." And Wash goes, "I don't need to know karate. I know crazy." <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's 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 you can't. Give him something like anything you give him. There's a zinger coming back at you. It doesn't matter what you give him. He's never off guard. If you ask him something like that, you're going to get something that you're going to want to print. It's nonstop with the guy. Do you have one? Yeah, it's hard to tell these stories, right? Because there's just a lot of F-bombs. In yeah. Uh, hey, no cuss words. There's stuff flying. Yeah. yeah right? there's prank. Just you could say effing. So we, yeah. oh, what F-ing. year was this? This had to be 2000, was it 2008? We traded for Matt Stairs when we were in Houston, or not in Houston. We were in old Minnesota, and like our big, our big trade deadline acquisition was Matt Stairs, and he walked in, and he got the group together, and we we wanted, you know, we wanted to get like three players, four players, whatever. Matt Stairs was a great hitter, yeah. good pinch hitter, could change a game, whatever. And we weren't mad about that, but we wanted to get more. And he walked in, he sat us all down, and he's like. We got Stairsy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's he's walking up and down the locker room, and we're in old Minnesota, and it's really tight in there. And he's like, "I don't care who we get; it doesn't matter. We're gonna we're we're winning. We're the we're the we're the cream of the we're we're that stuff, you know. When you <laughs> the, cream, the cream always rises, yeah, the cream always comes up." To the top, we, that's who we are. We're that. And someone like raises their hand, and they're like, "You mean the cream, the, the cream of the crop?" And he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> that's what we are. We're the cream of the crop." Oh, like, that's good. Perfect. Uh, there, there was like uh, a, a big lesson that was taught to me. I'm sure Ben felt the same. But we were doing middays at ESPN, and at the start of our show, this bombshell story comes down that. Ron Washington has failed his drug test, and so we do this whole show. We're taking calls, thinking, well, he's going to get fired. I mean, you can't do that, and we're going on and on and on. And then at the end of the show, C.J. Wilson calls in after you guys have all met in the locker room and talked to Wash. And C.J. proceeds to contradict everything that we had just thought was about to happen uh, and we had talked about for the previous two and a half hours, right? And it just had such an impact on me about, man, you're not in there. You don't know what those guys are thinking. And I want to go back to that moment where you guys had to get called in there and Wash had to talk to you because from from what I've heard in the past, it didn't take long for you guys to figure out it was no big deal. What were you thinking when you walked in there and how did that all go down? Um, What were you thinking, Mike? Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh took me a while to get to where cj was but uh <laughs> you know he, he we had a we had a night game in spring training I, I do remember this so you're not at the field and all of a sudden my phone rings it was like 10 so you need to get to the field i'm like 
Good boy. Yeah, something, something's up. And then we get there, and I think it was, you know, the usual suspects. I was in there with Ken's. I forget who else was in there. We go in the office and watch this start to spill it. And, you know, we, we said, hey, listen, like, um, you know, we went into a couple details. And at that point, honestly, like, we, we just didn't care. Um, you know, he's going to face whatever Major League Baseball decides he needs to face. They know about it. This is not a secret. We know the press is about to find out about it, too. So uh, we, we really didn't care. We'd been around him enough at that point. Um, again, it's we had uh, Josh actually was, was good because, you know, uh, you have, uh, you know, Wash had Josh's back all this time and then all of a sudden Josh feels the same way he's like hey man we're good and if there's one person who will probably speak on that to the press and have it like really make a dent it was going to be Josh Mm -hmm. Um, so it was um, it was good I mean I think again one of those moments where it's like power numbers so uh, everyone was behind Wash we we just really wanted to put it behind us it wasn't really much of a story for long at all it was it was quick and we moved on all right one of the guys we haven't talked about uh, is your little brother Elvis Andrews and so I'd love to get y'all's thoughts Ken's like when I bring up Elvis, do any stories come to mind, or what do you what do you think of when I bring up Elvis? He's just a joyful guy, man. You know, comes in the locker room as a twenty year old and just grabs the speakers, just just <laughs> grabs the music. Like I'm going to control the music <laughs> now as a, as a twenty year old, right yeah. in the big leagues. Uh, yeah, and he just grab he, and and no one's mad about it, right? Because he just comes in with a big smile, charismatic. Um, just loves to be there. Loves to joke around. Loves to, loves to be in the mi- middle of everything. Uh, definitely a younger brother type. I was more of like a middle child, you know. Mike's kind of the the elder statesman. Um, a- Adrian was the same way. Uh, very responsible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis Elvis was always causing problems and showing up late for things. And um, he, I can remember times when Elvis, you know, he played short. This guy played shortstop every day. Right, and he he put his heart out on the field and and was diving for balls at shortstop. Shortstop's a very demanding position. Mike knows he played it. Um, you know, at the big league level, it's just a demanding position. And I can remember Elvis; he's just wore out. And he's twenty one, so we don't care. We're <laughs> like, bro, we need you in the lineup, suit up. But I can remember watching him. I don't know if you remember the long hallway at the old ballpark from the clubhouse back into like the weight room. You'd walk by Wash's office. Mm-hmm. Well, I would be following Elvis down the down the hallway, and he's in his sliders and his shorts and his T-shirt. He's going to the training room for whatever, and he's walking just fine. And then right when he gets close to Wash's door, <laughs> he's got this limp, <laughs> you know? And he's limping by Wash's office, and then he gets past Wash's office, and he goes right into the training room, no problem. <laughs> and then on the way back to the clubhouse, he's doing the same thing. And, you know, our, our club, we didn't get mad at each other, man. That was like, that was the beauty of those teams. It's like, no one was pissed at that. You know, it was just like, Elvis, come on, man. We need you. Let's go. I know, I know how you're feeling. We got you, you know, and we just, we always had each other's backs and we never got let that little stuff like soak in and, and cause problems. And he was, he was a character, man. He's the best. He, I love Elvis. Yeah, it was it was the music thing was right away day one. Didn't ask, just said I got it. And we, I mean, Elvis was one of those kids, like the little brother, right? Like he comes by you and he's doing something, and you like get on him about it, and then he like takes like a couple steps away. You're like, I love it when he does that. Like, but you're not gonna <laughs> yeah. tell him that, right? Yeah. So he just he uh, we we needed him just for his personality. I think it just added to the, the entire group. Um, and it's you know he's still going at it, still playing. We're yeah. still pulling for him. We still follow every game he plays. Uh, and he's such a, just such a good kid, man. I uh, can't say enough great things about him. It really is kind of hard for me to process that, for example, he's still playing and you, you got, I mean, I know it's an age thing, but I just think of y'all as together. And then that feels like so long ago. And it's like, golly, Elvis is still playing. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Yeah. And like, for example, I don't even know, is Profar still in the majors? Yeah, he played last year. He's in he Colorado, did? Colorado last year. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, but I want to go back to Elvis for a second because he came over in that big Teixeira trade. Um, did y'all know anything? Because y'all also ended up getting, uh, now I'm blanking on the name of the closer. Salt Lam- oh. Felice. Felice. Yeah, Harrison, Felice. Ka- yeah. Harrison Tautlamakia. Mm-hmm. Golly, what and, an incredible and trade. Bo, yeah. Bo, Bo. Something. Bobo. Bobo. His name was Bobo, I think. Bo Effin. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when, when that trade went down, did y'all have any idea that y'all were getting that much in return? I was pissed yeah i hated every last bit of that trade at the time um we i wanted like 
major major leaguers, right? We're giving up one of the best first basemen in the game, and I wanted big leaguers. Uh, I wanted the guy to fill Texas' role and maybe give him a couple of pitchers too, and then we could turn this thing around immediately. Um, obviously, that wasn't the case, and our front office had you know better idea of what to how to capitalize on Texas' value uh, than I did. But right away, you know, Elvis comes in with that job, and again, it just he looked he looked and walked around like, hey, I can I can do this. We're good. Uh, and then, you know, it, bit by bit, they started showing up, right? Then Nephi comes in, and he's throwing 102. And then Harry comes in, we're like, damn, he's he's good. This kid's good. And then Salty came in, and he was, you know, he was, you could see the talent. It didn't happen with us, uh, but he ended up having a great career. So, I mean, bit by bit, these guys sh- start showing up and, like, plugging holes into our team. And then, no coincidence, like, that's kind of when our, our window kind of opened up. Um, so yeah, at the time I didn't really know. Cause again, I'm, you know, you have blinders on as a player. You don't care about the minor leagues. You don't care about anybody coming up to help. Um, when they get here and they help sweet, you're I'll be your best friend. Um, when you're wearing a minor league uniform, whatever, I, I, I do not care. So that was my take at the time. Yeah. The other thing about Elvis, you got to understand <clears throat> if you think back, Mike, Mike was the shortstop mm-hmm. and he just won a gold glove, right? Yeah. And we make this trade, and all of a sudden, this 20-year-old kid is supposedly the shortstop, and Mike's moving a third and playing a little short and playing, you know, a little first or whatever's going on. Like, that was that was difficult, I think, for our group, but the personality of Elvis allowed that to happen. Like, he didn't shy away from any of that, um, and he also leaned heavily, heavy on Mike. And, mm-hmm. you know, Mike handled it exceptionally well, but the – personality that Elvis had the character you know the character that he had allowed that to go a little bit more smooth I think you know obviously the character that Mike has and allowing that to happen right he wasn't happy at first um and then he I think I mean I'm speaking for you but I think he realized that this is this is going to be a good thing mm-hmm. um it, so it at the time of the trade it was weird right you're yeah. we're losing somebody that's in the middle of our lineup that plays every day plays a gold glove caliber caliber first baseman we're getting a shortstop when we have a gold glove shortstop that's our leader yeah a little weird right um but it all worked out it all worked out i mean it was crazy michael would go to an all-star game at any position like wherever you put him he's going to the all-star game but that's those are personal sacrifices for the good of the team in a cutthroat business where you really find out, man, they don't, they don't really care, uh, you know, about you, the person that might, they do, but they, it's a, it's a cold blooded business, but you were making decisions for the good of the team that probably weren't the best decisions for you personally. You know, you get comfortable at a position. I don't want to move. What do you, you know what I mean? But you did that for the team. That's incredibly commendable. And in fact, I don't want you to talk about that. And Ian, you got into that a little bit. What does that mean when a guy who's arguably your best player and without question your leader is willing to do things like that in professional sports? It means everything, really. It just sets the tone for the team and what is expected of of you as a player, right? You do whatever it takes to win. And, you know, there's people making decisions that cut out the emotion of that. Um, and being on the in the front side, you know, the front office side of things, those are those are decisions that we're a part of. Those are conversations we're a part of, and they're always hard, right? They're always hard because you know what the players are going through. You know how much effort they put into it, um, how much thought goes into playing a certain position, how difficult it is to learn a new one, all of the things that go into it where, you know, on the outside or a media member could just say, oh, move them to third, right? It's, it's easy. It's easy as that. Just move them to third. Well, there's so many d- different things that go into it. Um, and when your leader is doing that, it just resonates with the whole team. It resonates with the coaching staff. It resonates with the minor league guys all the way down through your organization. Um, you know, and Mike, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm just going to say it. He wasn't happy. I mean, he wasn't happy. Who would about be? It. I can't right. imagine. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't like, be? oh yeah, let's go to third for this 20 yeah. year old kid. But um, he never made it an issue. He never made it something bigger than what it what it could or as big as it could have been right when you have a all-star caliber guy guys getting 200 hits every year winning gold gloves <clears throat> you're asking him to move positions if that if that's the wrong person that can all you know send send waves the other way it can send negative waves to your organization and cause a problem um and it made us better and that's you know that was a really cool thing why are you like that michael yeah mike <laughs> um I, th- I think, um, one, I think I've gotten a little too much credit for that. Um, and not like I went over there, like, happily, you know. But um, I think for me, my thought was I would have loved to just, 
again, we talk about like earning certain things. I felt like I earned the second base job. I never wanted to move. I didn't want to go to short. I didn't want to go to third. And I definitely didn't want to go to first. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to play second. But because I moved, I got to play with this dude, right? Um, if I had stayed, who knows? Maybe he gets traded when he's a minor leaguer. Um, I got to play because I moved, I got to play with Elvis. Because I moved, I got to play with Adrian. These are things I'm taking with me for the rest of my life. Um, and then it comes down to like, you know, and even then, like, I still think that when guys earn certain things that that's it. I remember when I had already left the Rangers and remember, I don't know if they, they had kicked an idea of Ken's moving to first. Remember that? Oh, and, it's, it was a conversation. And you talk to me and you're like, what do you think? I'm like, if you do it, don't ever, <clears throat> no, hell no. You call him back right away and say, no, I've earned it. No. I'm like, you do not want to do this, man. You don't want to do it. So, but then it gets to a point too, where, an organization makes a decision, they make a decision, right? I yeah. can I can say my piece, I can say my point, I can say, hey man, I don't want to move to second, and they can say, well, Alex just got traded, and we need we don't have a shortstop right now, and I can say, well, go get one, and they can say no. So, <laughs> right. And then we get to spring training, and now once you're at spring training, I always kind of said this: I'm not the first athlete ever at a headbutting contest with his front office in an off season. That happens all the time in every sport. Now, once camp rolls around, you got a you got a decision to make. You can let this be an issue or you can put it to bed and say it's not good for anybody to let this be an issue everyone needs to be able to focus on their jobs and i need to focus on mine too so let's just let's put it to bed so that was to me kind of like my line in the sand was the second that we got to spring training it's over with i'm sitting here listening to you guys during all this and a lot of people have thought this and i'm thinking it now either one of you guys would be a badass manager but that's a grind and you've done so well for yourselves so you get to go play golf go youth sporting events and you don't have to be in that grind, but could you ever, I'll start with you, Ian, would you ever be a manager? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's just so demanding, you know. Um, I, I, I'll i never say, I won't say never. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll leave it there. Like, when my, my son's 12, when he graduates high school, he's off doing his own thing. Like, maybe, you know, we got six years, seven years. Um stay in the game, learn more. I think a lot of, you know, managing is difficult too. I managed in the WBC for team Israel and it's, it's not an easy thing to do. You got to experience that. Like you can't just jump right into the big leagues um, and manage a team. I think a lot of, you know, there are guys that have done that and it, it takes them a while to be successful. I would, you know, if I, if I was really considering being a manager, I would want to manage first, you know, managing mm -hmm. triple a or managing double a first for a season, two seasons and, and understand my style, understand how I react to certain situations, how I deal with umpires. I wasn't very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't. As, as sitting here right now, I don't. I don't think so. Mike, no way, not happening. Um, I guess. I guess you could never say never. But I'm at a point like I want to do what I want to do. Period. End of story. Simple and plain. Like if I want to go to. You know, last I was in Cabo two weekends ago. We made up our minds a couple of days before. We're like, we're out of here. Let's go. And we do it in the spring. We do it in the summer. We do it all the time. If I want to go somewhere and I want to do something, I want to do it. And I don't want anything holding me back. Um, I want to. I always kind of thought, well, you know, my kids are older, maybe. But then, you know, I got one who's going to go to college. I got. I'm going to want to go see him. And then he's going to get a job. Maybe it's not where I live. And I'm going to want to go take a flight to go hang out. And then he gets married and has kids. I'm going to go bounce to see the grandkids. So. I just don't see myself ever having being in a position where somebody else controls my time. Uh, to me, my most the most valuable thing I have right now uh, is my time because my time enables me to get my time with my family, and that's really all I want. So, if anything interferes with my time, I'm I'm out. There's just no way. And well, I just I'll just take back everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never manage. <laughs> <laughs> and on that. We end our afternoon with Michael Young and Ian Kinsler. Dudes, amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, Appreciate guys. it. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, for guys. Appreciate you guys it. earned the ability to just do whatever you want with your time, and Ben and I just ruined it for the last two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable.